Welcome back to the Discovery Doc Podcast. I'm here with your host, Dr. Cece, functional medicine nurse practitioner, self-proclaimed toxin tamer, and crunchy mama, and my co-host. I'm Anna Kate, your medical mystery overachiever and discovery liaison. And today we are going to get into your second brain. Yes. Did you know that you have a second brain? Isn't that so? <laughs> yeah. It's two brain cells left and they're fighting and yeah. Anyways, all of November is going to be focused on gut health. We have some awesome experts coming on to share just their perspectives and their knowledge with you. And so we're really excited to share that. But when I was thinking about what to talk about today, I wanted to bring it down to basics because I think gut health as a general term is very well known, but I don't think people know why. Like, what is your gut microbiome? What does that even mean? Why is it important? And I feel that if we kind of just establish those baselines today, Mm -hmm. that when we talk to our guests, then our listeners having that knowledge, it'll be so much more impactful right as to why this is important so bear with us it's going to be pretty educational but i think it's very important for you to know this and understand it so that you can make better decisions in your home or for yourself and understand why not just do it because someone says oh your gut microbiome is messed up well, what does that what mean? does that mean what do i do yeah yeah so jumping in we are going to literally start with what is your mug yes. your gut micro if i could say it right <laughs> I did take my nootropics today. I did. My brain should be kicking on here shortly. What is your gut microbiome? So what does that entail? And just tell us like why it's important that it's healthy. You have a healthy gut microbiome. So if you bring it back, I mean, all of us went through like high school biology, right? Or some sort of that science-y sort of class. So bring it back there. A biome is, is literally an ecosystem. And it's an ecosystem that is defined by what lives there, but also its environment. So if you think about your gut as its own little tiny little ecosystem, where trillions of microscopic organisms live, that is what our our microbiome is. It's it's literally a mini biome. So So, so when she's saying this, all that pops into my brain is that, (laughs) is that movie biodome where it was all perfect. They all had that ecosystem where they could live forever. And then they had two, um, three people that came in and disrupted the, the biodome. Yeah. Do you remember that? No, but it's a great point. Yeah. So they come and they do all this stuff and they like mess up their um, water system and their food system and all kinds of stuff. So we don't, I love the movie Biodome. It's like a 90s okay. classic. I'm the worst with references. I have no idea what you're talking about, no. but don't feel bad. I don't know any references. Like, well, we'll make a really funny joke and he'll laugh at himself. And I'm like, I don't get it. And he's like, of course you don't because you don't know how to put any references are ever. Don't take it personal, but this yeah. is a great analogy. Mm-hmm. And as I'm talking, bring that analogy in because that's such a great one. Because mine went to like a garden. And like for you know, nourishing your garden. Yeah. I like it was better. So if you've seen the movie, you know what we're what I'm well, at least what I'm talking about. Yeah. So if you've seen the movie Biodome back in the 90s, we don't want to have Polly Shore and uh Baldwin, Stephen Baldwin come in and just wreak havoc. So that's what other things that come into your your gut microbiome that should not be there, they're not the scientists of your body that are trying to make sure that you have clean water and you can grow your own food and you can live sustainably within your system. But if you have outside invaders come in, it becomes a problem. Chaos, right. And I think one point on, on in what our microbiome is, I think it's really, really important and people forget this, that out of those trillions of microorganisms, there are bacteria in there. There are fungi in there, little fungus. There are Fun guys. And now a word from our sponsor. With a looming fluvid season upon us, prevention is key. Supporting your immune and gut health every day is crucial. That's why I trust Stellar Biotics for daily immune and gut health support. With 20 years of science behind their metabiotic and probiotics, Stellar Biotics produces all natural supplements that are proven safe and effective for everyone in your family, children, nursing mothers, and even pets. I trust them for my family's immune and gut health support, and I hope you consider them for yours. Learn more at StellarBiotics.com and use coupon code DrCC10 to get 10% off your purchase today. There are parasites. There are viruses. 
I think people get so wrapped up in just thinking that it's our microbiome is made of, of good bacteria, which it is, but all those other little microorganisms exist too, to keep that dome mm-hmm. in balance. And I think that's an important fact that, that people forget, but the, basically the point of our biome is to one, regulate nutrients, of course, helping to absorb nutrients, regulate nutrients, produce nutrients. Also, it regulates hormones mm-hmm. very directly. It prevents kind of like you were saying, it prevents pathogenic or bad guys from entering. Yeah, we don't want more. System. We don't want more bad guys than we have good guys. But exactly. bad guys are going to be along with the good guys all the time. But we want more good guys than bad guys. Exactly. And in that sense, it also helps to regulate your immune system. 80% of our immune system lives within our GI tract, which we'll get into in a little bit. So having that balance literally directly impacts your immune function. So then second half of your question was, why is it so important? What does it do? Mm -hmm. And most of those good guys that you were talking about before have something called a symbiotic relationship. That is a biology word that I never thought I would use ever again in life. Symbiosis. Yes, exactly. It's like a dance. It's a salsa dance. And where they're hosts. And we provide them nutrients and fuel and they provide and and shelter and they provide services to our body. So that's what a a symbiotic relationship is, is you work synergistically Mm -hmm. and you benefit each other. Um, So back to what kind of Anna Kate was saying, if you like my thought went to, to a garden and if you nourish your garden and you, you know, have correct sunlight and water and nutrients for your plants, those plants are going to grow and then provide you with a service food, right? Young, you good know, food. Good foods. But if the soil is depleted or polluted. Or a parasite shows up. Yes, or pests or weeds or anything like that starts to overgrow your garden, then it upsets or disturbs that whole ecosystem. Right. And that's a problem. Yep. And if you're someone like me that has had, so my immune system is all kinds of wackadoo with all that I'm that I'm dealing with and then I had someone recommend antibiotics which totally raised my garden totally like barren desert weeds yeah like nothing just (laughs) nothing good there so why is that important that if we have to do antibiotics yeah. for specific reasons and not long term if you're a chronic illness person like me that you've been do a regular doctor that puts you on long-term antibiotics for Lyme doesn't do anything but mm-hmm. piss the Lyme off so it, the spirochetes that's a different oh, story okay. so I actually want to this is a great 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 question I want to continue with some little little basics and then that is a bullet point that I absolutely have to talk about because for me that starts even in infancy yes where babies and infants under two are exposed on average to six rounds of antibiotics. And within the first two to three years of life, that's literally when we build up our gut microbiome. Right. So that's a wonderful question, but y'all will have to stay tuned until next episode to hear my we'll, answer. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. All, all of the things. So getting into the nitty gritty. Yeah. So what happens when we're trying to I know we'll go into like putting really good things in Mm -hmm. and supplements that can help, but what's the basic of how do we love our digestive system to do the things? Cause you and I loved our, loved our mouths more than we loved our digestive systems this last weekend. As we're we're going into gut health topic, Anna Kate and I are sitting here struggling because we both decided to glutenize ourselves and my, I just, my stomach hurts so bad. I get so tired. I slept probably 12 hours last night. This chick has more chronic complications from yeah. it, um, but both of us are sitting here. It was worth it, and it was worth celebrating. And I got to spend some time with my nephews, and so treated them to something they can handle. They can handle it, but you know, I think it's so point. No one's perfect. No one's yeah. perfect. You do what you can, but these fun things come up. And actually, in our Thanksgiving episode, we'll talk about this a little bit more too. Around like holidays, how do you, you know, if you are allergic or sensitive, how do you maintain it? No. So stay tuned, stay tuned for that, for that one. Um, so we got lots of good stuff coming in. So excited about it. But back to kind of the function, the actual bodily function of our microbiome. It plays such an active role 
And honestly, it should be considered an organ itself. That's how imperative it is to our health. And kind of back to your digestive question, the bacteria in your gut help to break down certain carbs mm -hmm. as well as dietary fibers that you really can't break down on, on your own. And they also produce something called short chain fatty acids, which are really important nutrients as their byproducts. Um, they produce the enzymes that are necessary to synthesize, which just means make or create certain vitamins, B vitamins, vitamin K, like what? Yeah. How do you, all, how all do you these that? All, exactly. Um, and, and that might seem like a small fact, but if we become depleted in those micronutrients, that has major impact right. on our health. Um, the gut bacteria also fun fact, it helps to kind of stabilize the bile in our intestines. Which comes from the gallbladder. Yes. Awesome job. Um, so the liver, it comes from the gallbladder, but then the liver sends these signals to send the bile to the small intestine to help break down or digest fats Yep. specifically. And so when that's done, that bacteria and their enzymes help to break it down, which means if you didn't have that good bacteria, you can't break down those good fats. And now you're pooping out all that good information and your stools most likely float because they're fattier than they should be. Yep. Good, good <laughs> no, see last time, like last month, we talked about soft serve poops that look like soft serve ice cream and now floating poops. Yep. So exactly. And the other thing is what's important about that too, is if that doesn't happen, the bile kind of builds up. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, then your liver feels kind of overloaded and all these fats don't get absorbed and they build up too. And that's leftover cholesterol yeah that can then build up in your blood and then when you take when you test your hdl and ldl it gives a false reading of what's actually yes. happening because you may not actually have high cholesterol it's just something else isn't working we An need to do an absorption issue yeah. exactly we need to do a whole episode just on, on cholesterol panel yes we do yes and one on gallbladder and the liver and <laughs> how that system works together and how i di i digest I digest. But it's, it's true. I mean, you get so I have so many patients who come to me with their most recent lipid panel and a PCP try to put them on a statin like that. Mm -hmm. And you just break it down. And first of all, if, if I break it down, I, I do math and I do ratios nine times out of 10, that cholesterol is perfect. Mm -hmm. But people don't pay attention to the HDL number and the fact that it has no upper limit of normal. So if it's super good, well, of course, your total cholesterol is going to be high, right? It was just math. So do a ratio, divide it by the LDL and see where you're at. Anyways, if I'm, you made me digress. I'm sorry, but it's a if, if you have a high cholesterol panel and to you, the numbers are like, oh, well, it only looks a little bit off or something like that. Trust your gut. If you're going to a normal, <laughs> trust your second brain. Yeah. If you're going to a, a conventional doctor, that's totally fine. But if something in your heart is like, no, I don't think I need this medication, challenge them respectfully and say, okay, thank you. Could I do a calcium plaque score? Because a calcium plaque score will then show, do you actually have any buildup of that bad cholesterol in your arteries or not? And if it's a big old goose egg, then you decline that statin. Yep. Every time I have patients do that, it's a big old goose egg. Okay. So I'm going to okay. shout out, I'm going to shout out my sister-in-law, Melissa, because she had, she had this question mm. um, for me. And she was like, I said, you know, I'm not a doctor. Like, she's like, yeah, but you were, you see all this stuff all the time. Yeah. And I said, well, from what I understand and know, it may be, there's other things that you can do before you step into going yes. into a statin. So it's not, if what's our question, it's not, if this, what else can we do? Yes. So when, first of all, when, when patients see me about that, what I like to do is I like to break down, give the ratios, give the math to get them out of that fear zone yeah. of, oh, I'm going to die of a, of a heart attack right now. And if, I mean, I have lines, of course, if I do that math and I'm like, ooh, bud, like this is actually, but you have the calcium plaque score of a zero. I'm still comfortable. It gives us time. Right. What are you eating? What's your lifestyle? What are you doing in terms of activity? Supplement wise, ready rice and berberine are mm -hmm. fantastic. Red yeast rice is really good at lowering the LDLs, mm -hmm. but oftentimes like the LDL can be 120. It's not even that bad. You know, over hundred is normal, not 99, but the HDLs are really, really low. 
And that's our good cholesterol, right? That's our good fat. So oftentimes I like to flip the script because we get so fearful of cholesterol in society today that it's always labeled as bad. And it's, if you look at anyone who has a Mediterranean diet, their cholesterol, arguably the healthiest humans, yeah. their cholesterol is always going to be high for the right reasons because the HDL is high. Right. And so what I like to do with patients is I like to flip that, that process. We need cholesterol. We need it for literally every hormone in our body. So don't be fearful of it. Right. But you want the cholesterol high for good reasons, because you're eating a diet that's rich in olive oil and avocados and nut butters and salmon and fatty fishes. Not fried foods, exactly. not processed seed oils, not all, not all exactly. the junk. And to that point as well, we also don't want to be, we want to be lipid hydrated, not yes. lipid dehydrated. Yes. And so that plays into that too of, are we getting, are we getting our stuff, our fats from inferior sources, which changes that LDL and HD like that changes that ratio. Yep. But we don't want it to be so off that we're not lipid hydrated because that creates all sorts of problems as well. Yeah. And that that cholesterol, like good cholesterol is brain fuel. So you want that. So I, I work really hard to kind of retrain a patient's perspective to not be fearful of a high cholesterol right. because the HDL is so good. So I start there and help them kind of understand what that means. If I need to lower the LDL, yeah, red yeast rice is awesome. Some people, berberine works a little bit better. How's their glucose? You know, looking at some other things too, but wow, I did not mean to get into all that. That was awesome. Okay, so that, all of that information, right. we, yeah, we want to have more episodes where we just kind of dive in into this deeper system stuff. And so if you're listening and you learned something in the last little segment of this episode, please let us know, please ask us more questions to dive in deeper. And also if you learn something and you know someone else that could learn from that last segment, please share it. Please share this podcast, this yeah. episode um, and rate and review us. Cause it's free knowledge. That would be awesome as well. Free, no, the more you know, my <laughs> super short show. Okay, done. We should just end it. We should call it quits. <laughs> okay, we have to get back on track here. What? Gut biome. Yes. <laughs> Don't yell at me. <laughs> okay. Number two. Number two for yes. gut, gut biome, microbiome, and its function. We mentioned this earlier, but immune system, <laughs> don't look at me like this. Immune system function. Those good microbes that fill your gut actually help to train your immune system to fight off the bad guys. Right. So yeah, you know, like we said earlier, 80% of your immune system starts within your GI tract. So if you're not training the good guys to fight the bad guys. 80% of your immune system right. is just all of a sudden weakened. So this is like the muscle and the armor for your good guys is to build up that immune system and give them that, you know, put on that. Yes. Armor. And back to whatever her reference was for that movie. It's like, if, I don't know. yes, those good guys, when you, when you fuel them in terms of your immune system, it also helps to prevent bad guys from coming in and buying up houses or, you know, taking up real estate within your bi thing biodome biodome thank you <laughs> yeah so they're about to like lock themselves in this biodome for like five years or whatever i don't remember the time and then these like they're like uh they're not hippies they're some like not stoners they're something <laughs> it's that kind of like We're really free today guys yeah free uh wild and free stuff. yes yeah so they come in and disrupt everything because they're just these goof offs that are coming in and messing up everything. And they're supposed to be in this biome, self sustainable for like years, and they can't. It, it's the whole movie. Destruction. Yeah. So when that happens, then, so these guys come in and destruct. Yes. Now you get bad guys like C. diff or C. difficile or H. pylori, which he is Helicobacter pylori, that can come in and take charge and take opportunity and wreak havoc. But those guys are only given that opportunity if it's allowed. Right. We don't allow. Which it. is why C. diff is so common in hospitals right. with patients who have been on mega doses of antibiotics because they have no good guys left to protect their territory. Right. So this bad guy comes in and it just needs to put one little pinky toe on the edge of your lot. And then all of a sudden, yes, it takes over. 
Um, the other thing is the, the short chain fatty acids that we mentioned earlier that are good bacteria help to produce they actually are beneficial to our immune system by keeping and maintaining the gut lining and the yes. gut barrier. That is, if you're watching, it's integral because our gut lining should be like this, like kind of locked. And when we start to have things that are trying to invade, it slowly opens up like this. And now kind of these toxins can seep out um, and get into the bloodstream, right. which then causes more systemic of issues. Which is that term leaky gut. Exactly. And you get food particles and and is it food particles or it's other things it's really things that shouldn't be in your products, blood yeah. yeah they shouldn't be there in your bloodstream mm -hmm. but if that mesh was nice and tight that then that would put, get through right and now you have your immune system more systemically meaning throughout your entire body is reacting to that kind of toxic invader so to speak um the next one and I, I think this this is a really big one and I talk about this one a lot but I think it's also probably the least known in terms of just the common human is our nervous system yeah and our central nervous system is imperative to how we feel to how we can heal to just like whether we're staying in this crazy high fight or flight mode or we can adapt and handle stress and you know all the good things the and this is where it comes into play with that that second brain mm -hmm. that we don't like to say because the gut microbes <laughs> facial what are they called facial, facial expression thank you yes if you're not watching us on on our video you need to go over and join the yes. hilarity she's over here like hmm yes that's what her face just said to me um anyways the gut microbes can affect our nervous system through that gut brain access. So our gut and our brain are literally connected through a network of nerves and neurons and neurotransmitters, et cetera, that run through our, our GI tract. There are two really important neurotransmitters that are made actually within our gut. And for, for reference, when I say in your gut, it means in your intestines. I, I feel like no one says what that is anyways. If Small you intestine, large intestine? Yeah, both. Okay. Um, so serotonin and 5-HIAA are both made within our GI tract. Okay. A lot of the other neurotransmitters are made within our actual central nervous system. But CNS. Yes. So some, some people will say CNS may be short. Central nervous system. Exactly. So serotonin is, is like our feel good calming neurotransmitter and 5-HIAA is its byproduct. It's like its child. So when you have any sort of disruption within your GI tract, then our body tends to not be able to produce as much serotonin or produces too much serotonin. Usually I see deficiency in it, not access. Yeah. And so when that happens, we can have heightened anxiety. We can have worsening depression. We can stay in that kind of high fight or flight stage that we're yeah. talking about. And then um, that affects that cortisol. and Exactly. And it's a whole loop. You can have libido issues, sleep issues, memory issues, just because something's off in your GI tract, which then if you go to the doctor and you're like, I just have a lot of anxiety. I've never had anxiety before. And I'm starting to have, you know, a little bit of depression as well. It's immediately pinned as a psychiatric thing. Right. Could be your, your gut psychiatric problem, not your uh, psychiatric, what, psychiatric. Yeah. this brain. Something's up in the yep. GI tract. Yeah. Um, lastly on that list is our endocrine system. This is a big one too, because our gut microbes, they actually in their interact with our endocrine cells and the, those cells actually make, this is a fun fact. I had to write this down. The, the cells make your gut the largest endocrine system organ in the body. Think about that. So we have all our endocrine glands. We have our thyroid, we have our adrenal glands, et cetera. But the the fact that we have housed so many endocrine cells within our gut makes our gut actually the biggest endocrine system. Which is why we need to be careful with the foods and chemicals that we put in our body because yes. those endocrine disruptors of a, like additional chemicals that don't need to be there, food coloring, all kinds of, um, and we talked about that in a previous yes. episode yeah. on our endocrine system. So Go and listen to that as well. But that makes so oh, much like, sense. I know. It's, it's, I'm fascinated. I'm such a nerd, but it's fascinating. And so those endocrine cells that are within our GI tract, they secrete hormones that regulate our metabolism, that regulate how we synthesize blood sugar or our glucose. 
and how we feel hungry or how we feel full. And so there's a direct relationship when we have GI issues to obesity, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes. And then if you take it a step further, things like PCOS, menstrual cycle dysregulation, et cetera, because it's all hormone imbalances. Mm -hmm. So that's, I harp on this so much with my patients. I do not have the ability to look at our body as multiple different systems where, okay, it's just an endocrine system or it's just a GI problem or it's just a neurological problem. Because just from what we've gone through, we link every single system together. That's crazy. Look at my face. Okay. So we have that tagline. I don't know if I can remember if my brain's going to work. It may be normal, but it isn't. Nope. It might be common. Um, It might be common, but it isn't normal. That's it. Yep. It's just in there. Yeah. It might be common, but it isn't normal. And just to, I mean, if you're not getting the answers that you feel like you should be getting because someone is pigeonholing you or putting you in a box, go seek help elsewhere. Because a lot of times you just need to come around a a symptom or a chronic problem and and back up and look at the body more holistically. Mm -hmm. And by holistically, I mean, you know, head to toe instead of pigeonholing that patient as to, oh, okay, you have anxiety. Well, you need to see psych and here's an anti-anxiety medication. And Band-Aids don't fix problems. Yeah, yeah. So the now that you guys have that understanding with the microbiome, and Anna Kate has mentioned this a couple of times now, but the word dysbiosis is huge, at least in, in our community, dysbiosis yes. is huge. So what is dysbiosis? And essentially dysbiosis just means that you have an imbalance. Now the bad guys are outweighing the good guys, but it can come from different types of things. It can come from a deficiency in the good bacteria. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily like a problem child that has risen up and is causing havoc within your, I'll remember this word eventually. Biodome? Biodome. (laughs) The bio, I can't get. Um, But it can be the good guys are weakened. Right or they're, they're tired or fatigued. Um, the other one is an overgrowth of the bad, bad bacterias. And then lastly is kind of a loss of diversity overall. So those, any three of those factors can diminish kind of that nice equilibrium, that nice, Mm -hmm. like everyone is flourishing and developing well and turn the tables. So now we have bacteria or fungi or parasites or, or yeast, yeast or candida yeast. yep candida's a, candida's a big a big a big deal Candida is a huge deal yeah i mean even in little kids because they get thrush and what are some other common names i see it i'm i actually see it a lot in eczema kids huge candida is an issue with yeah. lots of eczema kids mold in general um but it's that that turning that tables where now you're giving power to the opportunistic things and that's when you're getting symptomatic so just like kind of our garden and our biodome, uh-huh. I'm going to show her a clip after this and you can be like, oh my gosh, that's hilarious. Yes. Your, your gut microbiome is, is impacted by positive things like nutrients, but also negative things like pollutants and pests and weeds that, that it's exposed to. And our gut microbiome goes through seasons of life. So it never is going to look the same. We constantly have to feed it and nourish it in different ways mm-hmm. throughout every step of our life. And that looks a little bit different. We'll get into that in the next episode. Um, and we've already talked about how in your what supplements that you mm-hmm. use for your family, how you go through that rotation to make sure that everything is so if you if you want to know the answer to that go back and listen to our what she what, what there, you, I said that I'm not saying it again yeah I'm just kidding guys just we'll tell we'll tell you probably 10,000 times very aggressive today this boy has me aggressive um but one of the biggest things that impacts our microbiome obviously is guests don't look what do you think what we put in our yeah pie, what we put in our pie hole yes and pie. it can't be pie it, I mean really good pie I mean I guess really it could be good pie we're not going down a pie rabbit hole right now. We'll do that for Thanksgiving podcast. Listen, yes, okay. Um, but yes, it is diet, and the we have to nourish kind of the diversity of those microbes because every if you think about it in terms of our our garden, right? 
every plant needs a little bit of something different mm -hmm. to thrive. Yeah. Some need to start inside. Some need to go outside. Some need different elements to, to grow mm -hmm. and be supported. So that the microbes in our GI tract, the pot, the good ones are the same thing. They thrive off of different nutrients and different fibers. Mm -hmm. So diet diversity is really important. Yep. And you talked about this. This is one of the things that you um, kind of preach on all the time. And you actually live this as well, is shortening the distance between where your food is grown and what, how it ends up on your table. Mm -hmm. So you've got a garden here. I've got a little garden at my house. I want to make a bigger garden. So that's on my to-do list um, for next year is to get that done so I can bring in fresh vegetables and then locally source our proteins, um, you know, get eggs, local fresh eggs, y'all. Oh, it's so different. So good. They're so good. And they're orange and they're yummy. They just taste Pretty better. Delicious. Oh my gosh. Yes. But it, it's so true because kind of my next point was that a diet filled with synthetic foods or processed sugars, it feeds those bad mm -hmm. microbes and depletes the soil that those good microbes are trying to grow from. Mm -hmm. And so you lose a lot of nutrients in that, those different stages that yeah. if you're getting your foods from, you know, the grocery store, they have to go through six different steps to get to your yeah. plate. But if you're going to a local farmer's market, it's likely to be that those foods are have much higher nutrients. Yeah. They haven't lost as much to the processing process. Yeah. So here in the U.S., we are food abundant, but nutrient yeah. deficient. deficient. Yes. So just because, I mean, there's, there's always a better choice. And if you can grow it at home, great. There's things, if you live in an apartment, you can grow things out on your, on your patio or inside, or there's all kinds of things. Yeah. So make the choice that you can, when you can, and just start making the things that, you know, work for you. Right. That's the word. And if you, and if you can't then focus on the whole foods, because yeah. there isn't a, there is not, I cannot tell you one positive to eating processed nutrient deficient foods. But I could tell you a whole bunch of positives when it comes to nutrient dense foods. Right. So start focusing on more of those whole foods, good fats. People get so scared of fat. Don't be scared of fat, but it's a difference of nummy, like saturated bacon grease and that goodness. And like an awesome, you know, egg, scrambled eggs with avocado on the side mm -hmm. and some olive oil poured on top with some pink Himalayan salt. Literally, that's what I want my life. Right. It sounds delicious. Gosh, I just created my breakfast in my head because yeah. I had an yeah. apple and a coconut yogurt. Okay. Anyways, the next thing that can impact our gut microbiome are, and Anna Kate said this earlier, chemicals. Mm -hmm. And this can be, I mean, chemicals pollute, think about your garden again, chemicals pollute your garden, your plants will die. So the same is the, the it's the same with our microbe. And this can be anything from alcohol to tobacco, to pesticides, to pollutants, to, you know, any of these toxins that we've talked about yeah. in previous yeah. medications <laughs> that aren't, I mean, yes. like, um, like, a pain, like over the counter painkillers mm -hmm. and, uh, anti-inflammatories, those can yeah. disrupt things. Now taking them every now and then probably not a big deal, but if you are chronic and taking them yes. every day, then that becomes, becomes a problem. Yeah antibiotics too, which again, mm -hmm. we'll talk about later, but that wipes out your, your good bacteria. And the other one are acid blockers. So we get like, I, I know when I was in high school, I used to pop Tums like it was candy. I mean, all the time. And that, so <laughs> there's a line guys. Yeah. If you have significant acid reflux and you need immediate relief, okay. But you cannot be living. Right on those acid blockers because it does impact your microbiome by changing the pH inside. And so seek out functional medicine providers. Yeah, and that goes either way. So it's the valve in your esophagus, there has to be the correct pressure to keep it close, right? So to lose that pressure can go too much pressure and it opens this way, too little pressure and it drops down and you get the same result. So knowing, do I have too much acid? Do I have not enough acid? Yes. 
Like that's a big thing. So I'm calling my husband out on that one because yeah. we need to get this sorted for him. It's he's, a huge one. And he won't eat spicy things because he says it gives him heartburn. And it's like, well, what is it? Is it too much or too like right or not a good not right. the good acid like people forget that something like butyric acid is really really beneficial and a lot of people who have acid reflux are actually very low in butyric yeah. acid yeah. so go see your functional medicine provider and have that discussion and figure out what yes. you're actually what that that uh dysbiosis is yes exactly because it's not a symbiosis it's not a symbiosis um the other thing is we talked about diet diversity with diet but diversity within those those good bacteria is really important as well and in a healthy microbiome those different types of microorganisms they all support each other just like certain plants cross pollinate mm -hmm. and help each other out you know help a sister out there so do our good bacteria within our gi tract so we we don't want that our our garden overtaken by those weeds or our pests and to do so we need to keep the diversity of our gut microbiome up, which yes. means the good bacteria up. Um, How do we get good bacteria? So I'm a stickler for, I mean, not everyone needs to be on probiotics, but I, oh gosh, rabbit yes. hole. Okay. Yes, you, every, you do. So well, you, some, some people can't tolerate them. It's a whole thing, guys. Okay. Some people can't tolerate them yet. So I don't advise everyone to go on probiotics because people who are super high histamine cannot tolerate probiotics yet. So it's, a, it's, not for everybody okay if you need more help seek more help but in general if we have a good baseline and we're overall healthy and we can tolerate probiotics don't be a creature of habit you have to diversify it mm -hmm. you have to switch it up so you know i again i cherry pick from supplement companies all the time but even for myself i go through i have like three that i just rotate through one one month one the next month one the third month and they're not, if you look at the back of your probiotic bottle, there's a bunch of strains of the good bacteria that's listed on there. And they might not differ 100%, but you want three or four options in those bottles that differ a little bit. So you're introducing new strains Thanks. of the good bacteria. Yeah. Um, also, spore base is really good. You have to be careful, not everyone can have spore base, but the spore based probiotics like Saccharomyces boulardii, they're a little bit stronger. And so they can, when we ingest them, they can withstand the acidity of, of the stomach, the acid of the stomach, and make it to the small intestine where then they can release something called endotoxins, which is what we want. We want right. them to get rid of the bad guys. So something like a spore-based probiotic is better for killing bad guys off than necessarily replenishing good guys. Yeah. So they're the, they're the seals and the special, they're the special forces team. Yeah. Yeah. So I do like, I go in and out of it every once in a while, just to maintain gut health. But in terms of just your traditional probiotic rotate and, or if you're someone who doesn't like to supplement, who wants it from food sources, then obviously your fermented foods. Mm -hmm. um, that's another issue with high histamine humans, <laughs> which we'll talk about a lot. Another another time. Yes. Um, but if your diet is really rich in nutrient dense foods and you can focus on probiotic, you know, rich foods, mm -hmm. then that's appropriate too. It's just that in the convenience of the everyday modern American diet, that's lacking. Yeah. So that's why I turn to supplementation quite a bit. Yeah. Um, the other thing, last thing on kind of this list is motility. Motility is, is just movement. And motility is regular movement of your poops. How often are you pooping? Once a week is not enough. No. What is it? Is it little rabbit pellets or is it a nice little firm log? Does it float? Right. Is there stringy things? Is there mucus? Is there undigested foods? Like all those are questions mm -hmm. that if you said yes to outside of a nice formed log, then you there might yeah. be a little dysfunction there and color as well. It should be a nice Concord Brown. Exactly. And that is how often we poop is literally how your quote crop of microorganisms mm -hmm. can turn over. So if we're right. not getting that gunk out, then good things don't have a chance right. to grow and cross pollinate. And if your microbiome is kind of where it should be in its sweet spot, your poops aren't going to like explode the bathroom. Exactly. It's not going to, I mean, it smells like poop, but it's not going to be like, no one can go in there for a month. Right. It's not like a dead animal is yeah. hiding in the toilet. That's a red flag y'all. Yeah. 
So, and there's a couple of ways to have, um, I know we always think of constipation as being backed up and everything being tight and compacted. The hydration and lipid mm -hmm. hydration are two things that can cause that. But also the other way of having very loose stool and being yes. diarrhea is also a form of constipation. Yeah, exactly. So it absolutely is. And the one thing that I think is fascinating that I don't think enough people know is that that transit time is also important because one, it's showing you how frequently your body is absorbing the nutrients, mm -hmm. but two, we're going to get to just, I, mean, I want everyone to imagine this right now. Okay. The movement your, the fecal matter that is moving through your intestines and that's waste, right? We're pooping it out for a reason, but it's also distributing microbes along the way mm -hmm. in different places. So if it's too fast, like more diarrhea or loose stools, then those microbes don't have a chance to stick and to settle where they need to be. Right. If it's too slow, then those microbes stick where they are and have too long, they have too much of a chance to overeat and overgrow mm -hmm. and spread beyond their territory where they're not supposed to be and then cause an issue. Right. And then that's a really, that's a, a big point for me because I don't think a lot of people know that. I think people just think poop is poop and you're getting rid of things that your body doesn't need. But flipping that thinking and also saying, well, hey, a long transit it's depositing information mm -hmm. and it needs the appropriate amount of time for that information to stick right very good information i know this is a good this one has been a good episode so yes. we want to introduce something new on this episode so if you're listening we also need your help because we want to answer your questions so our very i'm very excited about this our very first mailbag question our discuss what do we want to call this so one you'll help us <laughs> help us determine what our discoverers mailbag or I don't know something we need a creative name I'll help us. that is where you guys ask questions and we answer it so someone more creative than me think about yeah. it Thank so y'all can go to our website at discovery.com forward slash podcast and enter the question right there if you've got a suggestion for a title I mean a topic or you want to get into something else um, or you just want to tell us how much you loved what you've learned. So we want to give you back out a shout out in that way. And then, um, yeah, so we, I want to get into our first question. Yes. I'm so, so excited. I'm so excited. That's about a really good question. So this came from my nephew, Lucas, who is about to be seven on the 20th, um, of October. So he's six right now. This came from a six-year-old. He's so smart. Okay. Great question. So we had, we were talking about gluten and they call me Nana and Nana brought up that it takes eight weeks for when you're when you eat gluten for your body to process and get rid of the gluten and he asked me he said Nana how does your body get rid of gluten and why does it stick around for eight weeks Nana did not know so Nana had to ask yeah. so shout out to Lukey happy birthday um, this will be after, oh, yeah, yeah, it'll be after your birthday by a week or so when this comes out and you get to hear this, but I am thankful for Lukey to be our very first question. And this is a very good question for a seven-year-old. Yeah. A very, very good question. Kids amaze me yeah. with just whatever. That, that's a really good question. Dude. They're so observant. Yeah. So gluten, if we, if we don't have a gluten intolerance or a wheat allergy or celiac or something, it takes 70 hours, 70, seven, zero hours for gluten to move through the tummy through the small intestine through the colon and for us to poop it out essentially so that's two to three days and that's if you have no immune reactivity to it whatsoever which is how many people raise a hand yeah that's not me yeah, i can't nobody. raise my hand on that one okay so it's exactly said it's a very very slow nutrient to move through the body anyways two to three days later without someone who has, I mean, no immune reactivity to it whatsoever. Most of us, and then like my patients, me, you for sure, when we have a sensitivity and we eat that gluten, it triggers something called an antibody response, which is like an immune response. Usually it's IgG or IgA mediated. These are just two different types of immunoglobulins, uh, two different kind of parts of our immune system. And when it triggers that antibody reaction, that's what then triggers damage to occur within our GI tract and damage within that gut lining that we said should be like this, like nice and tight junctions. 
those junctions kind of start to separate and now more toxins can flow out into the bloodstream causing more of that systemic reaction that we were talking about earlier that then causes inflammation so if we think about that process those antibodies the reason why for most people it takes at least eight weeks to get out of the body is because those antibodies that odd that immune reactivity those antibodies have a half-life of two months yes so iga antibodies gluten antibodies have a half-life of two months igg antibodies gluten antibodies have a half-life between one to two months so in reality it can take four so i'm gracious when i tell patients eight weeks it can take four months four months to clear those antibody reactions so that is what where like people like ourselves or Anna Kate over here if you have an exposure to gluten and you're super sensitive to it then that antibody reaction is really not going to be what it was until four months later so that is what I mean by that gluten takes at least eight weeks to leave the body and so I'm going to we both again we both glutenized ourselves this weekend so uh, we got another eight weeks to go <laughs> yeah okay so let me think of let me phrase this in a way that because you said lots of big words that as brilliant as the question is i don't know if you can understand it that yeah, way that's a tough so, one to, to bring down okay so if the if we get have we get the gluten and we have our our mesh is can we say that the antibodies are like uh, like a battering ram or like a grenade that's being thrown at that wall you ever play the game at the arcade where it's like the laser beam um little shooter thing and you try to hit all the little moving thingies yeah so it's like that it's like that oh okay and it's, it's the that laser beam is just poking little holes alien invaders alien invaders that that's are poking holes in yeah. your and in, in your gia and your gut and kind of your organ and then yucky stuff can come out okay and that yucky stuff creates just chaos and that chaos is what you can feel for the next up to four months that's as that's um, i tried bud that's as, that's as no, not no, scientific I, as i can i think i think he will i think he will understand that so i will definitely follow up with him and and know that so all right part two of our um shout outs that we're going to start doing is um sharing the reviews that you have left us for oh can you go back and do that sorry i it was a really i was one. so prepared i know and then i wasn't prepared it's all good so if you're learning stuff from our episodes one tell us more about what you want and two please rate and review and share these episodes so if yeah. anything can be shared with a friend please do that and then go and rate and review that hey you're really learning from us and that you like our goofiness um because we're just here to have fun and sit on the couch and have conversations. Yeah. Um, but we wanted to give a shout out to um, Jelly Bean. She spells it J-J-E-L-L-E-B-E-A-N. So her review was, I love Dr. Cece. I'm so grateful for her podcast now too. So much information she's freely sharing with the world. We need this. These episodes are packed full of information and goodness. You'll definitely want to take notes. So I love you. Big shout out to Jelly Bean. Um, I love because I have a Jelly Bean. So our Jill, my my puppy Jillian. Um, uh -huh. I call her Jelly Bean. So my, husband, my yeah. husband just got two puppies. We're about to have a baby in a couple of months, and my husband got two puppies. I don't want to talk about it. Anyways, Jelly Bean, we yes. love you. Thank you. That it really makes us feel good because yes. we love doing this. We do, but it's really reassuring to just have some positive feedback or any feedback at all that's what you know makes us want to keep doing it so yeah so rate review like share all the fun things all over the place download us wherever you listen to podcasts share us on um what are we on spotify and apple itunes and youtube and kind of all of that stuff so we really appreciate it and it lets us know that you're hearing us and listening so um let us know and also on youtube go ahead and leave some questions or notes in the comments yeah, yeah we're happy to answer them yeah um and stay tuned we have a uh, kind of second part of this conversation with all kind of the basics of gut health and then some other fun thanksgiving episodes coming up as well some awesome yeah. gut health experts so y'all stay tuned this month we have a lot of good things coming for you absolutely 
So until next time, let's discover together. The content provided in this podcast provides general information and discussions on various topics related to health, wellness, and medical advancements. However, it is essential to understand that the content provided in this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The hosts, guests, and contributors are individuals sharing their personal experiences, opinions, and knowledge in their respective fields. While they strive to provide accurate, up-to-date information, medical knowledge is constantly evolving and the information presented in this podcast may not always reflect the most current research and medical guidelines. It is crucial to consult with a qualified healthcare professional or medical expert for specific medical concerns. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking medical treatment based on the information presented in this podcast. The Discovery Doc Podcast encourages listeners to use their own judgment and discretion while implementing any suggestions, recommendations, or lifestyle changes discussed in this episode. Each individual's medical situation is unique and may work for one, may not be suitable or safe for another. The podcast hosts, guests, and contributors are not liable for any direct, indirect, consequential, or incidental damages or harm that may arise from listening or acting upon the information provided in this podcast. Listeners are responsible for their own health decisions and should exercise caution and seek professional guidance when necessary. By listening to this podcast, you acknowledge that you have read, understood, and agreed to this medical disclaimer. If you have any questions or concerns about this medical disclaimer, please consult a qualified healthcare professional.